I'm going to start my story in 1991 because that's when I graduated from law school. Uh, it was a promising time to be a woman in law. We had had three women appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. Our law class was the first class at UBC to enroll over 50% women, and eight out of the ten top students were female, and I was number four. So I got to clerk for the Court of Appeal, I articled at a big firm, I got an associate job, and then I moved to a boutique firm where I had a beautiful office, a great mentor, and the lawyers that I worked with were genuinely kind, supportive human beings, which I know is not everyone's experience, but mine, my lawyer friends were. But I was not happy. I was anxious a lot, I had panic attacks, I had insomnia for almost a year, and I had a bad case of imposter syndrome. I felt like I was living somebody else's life. So I needed to make a change, and luckily I knew what I needed to do, because I had grown up in the Oprah generation. <laughs> so all I needed to do was find my passion and commit to it. This was the era of do what you love and the money will follow. Uh, don't settle, be your best self. And why wouldn't you when it was so easy to transform everything about yourself and have fun doing it? <laughs> so I quit my law job and I went into graduate school at SFU in clinical forensic psychology. Uh, because my passion had always been people. I was fascinated by the things that motivated people and why two people could end up on very different paths. So I wanted to study uh, the people and particularly the people in the legal system. So I kind of naively assumed that once I followed my passion, that the happiness would flow to me. And that is not what happened. What happened was that I was still anxious, and now I was broke and anxious, and had to do a dissertation. Uh, at least in law school, you don't have a room full of people watching you do your final exam. Uh, so it turns out there is no simple inside plan. I ran smack into the old adage of wherever you go, there you are, and that there was a lot of hard, painstaking work still to come. So one of my profs recommended that I start therapy. So I did with a psychiatrist who practiced the blank slate method. So basically, uh, I sat in a room and talked to myself for an hour a week, which was moderately helpful, but very slow. Um, and the medications she prescribed were also moderately helpful. But then I discovered cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT is a empirically supported, result-oriented type of therapy that causes you, challenges you to bring all your biases and assumptions and underlying beliefs and bring them out into the forefront of your mind and then challenge them and eventually abandon the ones that are distortions. It's a very stepwise approach to therapy where you set small attainable goals and then as you reach your goal, you set another goal and you constantly work in a sort of forward direction, eventually getting close to your ultimate life goals. And for me, my um, ultimate life goal was, like some of the other people said, it was to be more present in my life and to get out of my head, to stop worrying so much. I wanted to stop personalizing situations that weren't about me, and I wanted to stop focusing on trying to win arguments and move towards having conversations. And I needed to stop expecting danger. For someone who was successful, I sure worried about failure a lot. I played through infinite scenarios in my head in order to rehearse what I would say or do so that I would never make a mistake. And then afterwards, I would pick it apart in order to look for the pieces where I thought I had screwed up. And none of the changes in CBT happen overnight. It's very much like physiotherapy. I tell my clients it's more like physiotherapy than chemotherapy. It teaches you skills, and you have to use them and apply them. You can get guidance from a therapist or a book or even an app now, but you actually have to go out and do the exercises. So an example of how this works, in, I had a client, a young male client, who had crippling social anxiety. He couldn't eat in public, he couldn't take the bus, he avoided crowds, he couldn't talk to strangers. So after um, I taught him some relaxation skills, we developed a hierarchy of challenges that he went out and did. And some of them were as simple as going to Tim Hortons and getting a coffee, standing in line and ordering a coffee. 
And like most people with social anxiety, he feared that he would trip or drop something or start crying and people would ridicule him. And of course, that didn't happen because he was an adult buying coffee and not a teenager trying to take part in gym class. Personally, for me, when I was a fairly new forensic psychologist, I worked at the Youth Detention Center, and I worked with a lot of traumatized youth and some very violent young people. And I started to become jumpy and uh, fearful. And if I saw a group of teenagers on the road, I would cross to the other side because I expected trouble. So what I did is I started going to the school where my husband teaches, and I would watch the kids on the playground and focus on how many were smiling. And the reality was, they were almost all smiling because most children in our society are not abused or traumatized. Most teenagers are not violent. But I needed to actually go to the school and do that exercise in order to switch my thinking. So even though I followed my passion, and I do have a job I love, I believe that my happiness and my mental health are more related to the thousands of little decisions I made after that one big monumental decision. And in that way, I'm more like Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs than I am like Oprah. And his philosophy, he thinks we're doing a disservice to our young people in convincing them all that they can follow their passion and support themselves with that. You wouldn't believe how many clients I have who want to be rap stars and professional video game players. But they have very little tolerance for practical things like building skills. So I know it's a bit hypocritical for me because I did follow my passion and it did work out. But I, it wasn't an easy, straight ahead pathway. It was 10 or 12 years of not constant work, but some pretty serious work. And in the end, it turned out um, it was an advantage for me. And it was totally worth it, because now I sleep like a baby. And I almost, almost never worry. Thank you.